I guess they call that what they call that growth. <laughs> At that age, you know what I'm saying? I think about it now, if my son at 16 told me he wanted to leave home, it's like, shit, that's a tough decision to make. So for my mom to even let me leave home at that age was kind of crazy. But, you know, not to, I had to, I had to, I had to go. You know what I mean? If it was between staying in Montreal and leaving, I had to go. Staying out here wasn't, wasn't in the plans for me, man. I couldn't. I seen what would happen if I stayed here in Montreal, so I had to get up out of here. But being able to go to D.C. for two years, finish high school, Syracuse for four years, and have such a decorated career over there, and being able to get drafted in 2012, um, which was big for myself, my family, the city. Uh, being able to play overseas for nine, ten years, you know, that's huge, man. They didn't believe, for whatever reason, I did, you know what I mean? And luckily I had someone right there sharing a bunk bed with me that, you know, I call my idol to this day, my brother, who was able to kind of show me the blueprint of how to get it done, you know? Uh, so for me, it, was, it, was, it wasn't as hard as it would be for other people. I had someone right there with me. Okay, you gotta do this. He's the man, he's all world. He's at Champlain, he's going crazy. He's going to ABCD camp. And I'm like, fuck, that's my older brother. Like, this is crazy. ABCD camp is like, you know, top dogs over there. So for me to be able to see him in the flesh and have someone show me the blueprint kind of made things easier for me. And, uh, you know, for me to be able to give back, like I said, give back to the community that gave so much to me, it was a no brainer for me to come back and start coaching. It would, I'd be doing these kids a disservice, really. If I didn't come back and start coaching and helping the youth out, like I'll be doing this whole city a disservice. So when I go out and I'm coaching kids or I'm doing a workout or whatever I'm doing, going to speak at high schools, it's to help these kids out, man. You know, so I have two successful successful years um, at Syracuse. End up going for my senior year again. I led the team in scoring my, my junior and senior year. My senior year, I got first team all Big East, which is, you know, the top five players in the conference, which is tough, you know, to get. Big East ain't no slouch conference, like I said. Um, so that was big time for me. You know, all these individual accolades were cool, but the ultimate goal was always to become a pro, play basketball for money. Like, it's a kid's game. You play this shit at recess, right? So you want to get paid for it one day. Um, and that's what I was, everything that I did was geared towards, like, I got to, you know, make a couple of dollars playing this game, whether it's in the NBA, whether it's, you know, playing pro um, overseas. I just want to be able to say, like, I made money playing the game that I, that I love so much that I started playing on a, a trash can in a high school, uh, in an elementary schoolyard, you know? So that was big time, man. And it, and it happened. Life hit me, man. I had a, my daughter, you know, while I was overseas, you know, she was born in uh, 2013, 2014, sorry. She was born in 2014. And it's like, do I go take a chance going to the, to the NBA and, making that D-League salary, which wasn't a lot. It ain't like it is today. That D-League salary wasn't much, man. So, or do I go overseas and make some guaranteed money? You know, you could take care of your family because at the end of the day, that was the most important thing to me was I have a daughter on the way. I got to make sure that I have the means to support her. And with all the instability of the league and uncertainties, like I wasn't up for just rolling the dice on that one. So I stayed overseas. Ended up carving out a real good, you know, name for myself out there, solid career. And I just, it just so happened that I stayed overseas uh, for the rest of my time. Basketball done too much for me. It opened too many doors for me, allowed me to meet too many people. Um, so for me to just give up on ball, something that I've been doing for my whole life, damn near, it was never a thought, never. Couldn't do it. Couldn't imagine myself quitting ball. Like just saying I quit, nah, couldn't. Uh, and again, it reversed back to my brother. Having someone, having a sound mind to speak to and him giving me the motivation, like, oh, dog, you're nice, man. Don't worry about it. Like Everything's going to work out the way it's supposed to work out. Just keep working hard. Um, don't give up on your dream. At the end of the day, I was in the sixth grade and, you know, I wrote in my little graduation whatever it was book that I want to become a professional basketball player. And I never forget my teacher and I'm going back now. I know we're going front, back, whatever, but I never forget my teacher told me in the sixth grade, 
Zian Paquette was her name. She told me I should erase that. Like it's not too uh, too likely that you become a professional basketball player. So I knew I would never quit because in the sixth grade when she told me that, I looked back at her and I said, no, nah, it's cool. I'll keep it here. Like basically I said, no, this is what I want. So I'll keep it here. I always had that, you know, that about me was if I wanted to do something, I couldn't let someone else tell me I couldn't do it. Or, you know, you hear that all the time. Like it's almost like a cliche, like don't let no one tell you you can't do something. But that's real. That's as real as it gets. You know, the thing about basketball is when you're on a team, there's so many life values like that come with being on a team and that's going to help you in everyday life. You know what I mean? What I tell these kids is, you know, you every time you step on the court, you got to bring three things, your energy, your effort and enthusiasm. That doesn't only go for basketball. If you go into the work, if you if you apply energy, effort and enthusiasm to school work. You're going to do all right if you put that into whatever it is you want to do uh, in your in your work life. You know, what I mean, you're going to be all right because you're going to wake up every day. You know, you're going to put in your effort. You're going to give it energy and, you know, you're going to be enthused about it. You know, you'll be straight no matter when I was at my highest point in the league, whatever the case is at Syracuse. Um, I always made time for people who, you know, wanted to speak and needed someone to speak to because at that point I understood that it wasn't just about me, it's about the millions of kids watching, whether it's in, in Canada, in the States, in Syracuse, in Montreal, I knew that there was a lot of kids looking up to me, right? And my whole thing was always, damn, I gotta give them hope. You know, so when I see kids and, you know, they hit me and they tell me, you gave me hope, you made me believe, like you helped me from Montreal, like it was hard to see, but you were one of the first people to kind of go over there and really make noise and, that's why I was able to believe. So that's that's kind of was always part of it for me. So again, teaching these kids like you know how to be good human beings and <clears throat> in the world, that's all it is, man. Basketball is one thing, but being a human, being a good person, that's forever. Everyone used to say, you know, the ball's gonna stop bouncing at some point. You know, when you're 16 years old, 17, you ain't really trying to hear that shit. Like, oh, what you mean, bro? I got. 15, whatever, however many more years you believe you're going to be playing. But, you know, that's that's the truth, man. The ball stopped bouncing for me. Um, I'd say prematurely, I made the decision, you know, to stop playing ball um, and start giving back for for a few reasons. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you got to be a good person. At the end of the day, that gets you further in life than, than basketball because that shit going to stop one day, you know. People who are dickheads, people who are not good people, not with, with malintent, they don't get opportunities that the good, good hearted, kind hearted, genuine people get. And that's a fact. You got to treat people right, man. That thing always comes back around. No matter how long it is, it'll come back around and you'll be blessed too one day. Most of my life, I lived with my mom, probably four years old on, you know, whatever it was, I lived with my mom. So, first and foremost, I want to be sure that when it was my time to have kids, like that I would be present. Like, you know, and shout out to my dad, you know, God rest the dead, uh, God bless the dead. But I want to make sure that I was around more than my father was. So that was already like a, that was already something for me as a kid. Like, man, when I have kids, like I'm gonna make sure I see my kids a lot more than my dad sees me and make sure I do more things with my dad. So fatherhood is huge. I knew that there's no there's no blueprint like to fatherhood, you know, especially when you don't really have one present. I don't want to say present, but just not there as much as you would like to. You know, as I got older, our relationships got a little bit, like I said, we mended things and that was my dog. So for me to lose him, um, you know, was tough uh, because you know, there's still a lot of things that I wish we could have spoken about, still a lot of conversations to be had and things of that nature. And I wasn't able to have those conversations. And what's crazy is I was thinking to myself, you know, this summer, well, last summer, that's when I'm going to, you know, we're going to have all these conversations like, why did you and my mom not work out? Like, what happened? You know what I mean? Like, these are the conversations that we never had that I figured, you know what? Man to man, like we're gonna have these conversations, and just I wasn't able to, you know, have those talks. But um, it was tough, man. I, I still think, you know, to this day, I don't know if I dealt with it the way I should have dealt with it. Like I still feel um, sadness for sure every day. You know what I mean? Like, but I feel like life is moving. I still, I got my kids. I have to figure things out. Like I never took a moment for real to 
I don't want to say acknowledge, but to really deal with the loss, you know, fully. You know, did her best to make sure we had meals to eat, clothes, books, put us on, you know, field trips, like all type of shit. And you're just thinking as you get older and you understand the value of a dollar and understand that we didn't have a lot of dollars, you know what I mean? One parent, four kids and a grand grandchild all under the same roof. Everybody has food. She's baking. She's making. We're not buying bread. She's baking bread. Like we're not buying no pastry. She's making cake. Like she, you know what I mean? There's no extras. Oh yeah, you want a burger? You want Harvey's? Yeah, I'm gonna go get some minced meat. I'm gonna fix you guys a burger. Like there's no eating out. She did everything, you know. So her being so tough, I think definitely, you know, for all of us, you know, my brother, my sisters, myself, it, uh, you know, kind of hardened us, you know, kind of calcified our emotions a bit. Like, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think that definitely plays a part into the, you know, plays a part into how I am today. You know, I was going overseas for X amount of years. My niece, nephews are growing up. My mom is getting older. You know what I mean? Now I come to the hospital, like I, I wasn't able to speak to my dad for the past, whatever. I wasn't able to go visit him in the hospital like my sisters were doing, because they were home. And the one time that I get back, the first time that I see him in the hospital, we can't communicate. Like, we can't talk. He can't talk back. He's, he could clearly hear me, but he can't talk back. And I think that's that's going to haunt me for the, for a long time. Like, till this day, I think I'm still sad about the fact that I wasn't able to talk to him one more time before, like, he transitioned, right? But, uh... Yeah, that was tough. That was tough till this day. It's, it's, it's still real tough. It's still, you know, like I said, it still haunts me. Within our community, for whatever reason, like these are things, I don't want to say this, I guess, I don't want to use the word frowned upon, but like we don't do a great job of seeking help, I feel like, you know? And whether it's because help makes you weak or you might look strange or somebody, if you tell somebody you went to go see somebody, they'll look at you kind of crazy or whatever the case is. Um, but I, I thought of some things and I just never acted on them. Like, okay, should I go see somebody? Like, who do I see? I, I know a few people who see therapists and I ask them about their experiences. And sometimes it's like, well, you know, I was seeing one, but he didn't really get me or she didn't really get me. So, I'm, so for me, it's like, well, who gets me? And that's why I always revert back to family. Like, who gets me? My family gets me. They know me since, you know what I'm saying? Not since I was a baby, my, like, they know my emotions. They know when I'm happy, you know? So I don't want to go, and it's not a, you know, a money thing or whatever the case is where you have to go. You know, it's not about that, but it's like, damn, I don't want to waste my time going to see somebody who I feel, and it's, and it's crazy to think, like, because I haven't tried it, so I don't know if my time would be wasted or not, right? But for someone that when I ask, a lot of people are coming back with the same thing. Like, ah, oh, they didn't get me. I'm still now I'm searching for a new one. Like, I'm trying to figure it out now. It's like, well, fuck, bro, let me know when you get one. But the one that they find might not be the one that's for me. Maybe it's the one that didn't get them that would get me. You know what I mean? So I don't really know. And I guess the first step is just taking that first step. I look at my basketball career as, you know, I was successful. You know, I played 10, whatever, 11 years as a professional, like as somebody out of Montreal, that doesn't happen too often. And again, like it always comes back to the kids. Now I see Quincy get Quincy was at Syracuse, now at Oregon. You know, we had uh, Lou Gantz. We have you know all these kids who are gonna become pros, and we have Montreal guys who are pros now. And honest to God, like you can't talk about Montreal basketball without talking about me. You know what I mean? And that's just a fact. So all the kids that are doing it, you know, whether you're the NCAA level, whether you're at the pro level right now, um, in some way, shape or form, I was a part of the motivation. I was a part of the, it could happen because whether they don't know and they're told, you know, my story is being shared in a lot of basketball gyms, a lot of basketball rooms, practices, meetings in Montreal, workouts, whatever it is. So that's, that's that's dope to me like that my story and you know the fact that i was one of the first you know there was bill wellington you know he played with mj but don't nobody remember bill 
You know what I mean? But they'll remember Chris Joe. That's a fact. 